Unfortunately, uh, there's no Simon here to introduce me, so uh, I'll have to introduce myself, but you already know, well, we had that round the table yesterday, so my name is Chris, uh, this is Rick, um, and we'll be taking you through your first uh, tutorial of the week. Um, okay, so in terms of this being a hands-on session, I thought we'd start off by getting you to use your hands. So, can I have a show of hands for people that have used R before or are familiar with how R works? One, two, three, four. Okay, there's a few of you. Uh, how many people have actually heard of R? Most of you have heard of it, which is good. Okay. Um, and then the next set of questions. How many people uh, program uh, regularly or are quite competent with a, a particular programming language? It's not a test, just uh, okay, most of you. How many people, uh, what's the next question? So we're doing it three levels. How many people say did it, studied it maybe at university or something, don't regularly program? rough idea of programming, but and how many people would call themselves like programming, programming illiterate or something like that, or have no understanding of programming at all? I mean, a small number. Okay, I ask this because uh, one of the key things with, with R is it's very much scripted based, so it's a lot. Of, it looks basically a lot like code, uh, and so I'm hoping that we try and make this as easy as possible for those, particularly without much programming experience, to understand some of the concepts um, and how to use it. I'm, I'm hoping it doesn't just become like a copy-paste exercise, but you can learn something from this. We'll see how we go. Uh, so we'll just go through uh, a few things in terms of what, what the R actually is, uh, what it can, uh, can do, and, and why to use it. Um, I did just look at a, a few brief things. So um, R is from 1993 uh, and was uh, introduced by Ross, although I can't pronounce his surname. Anyone else know? Finding points for the, the inventors of R. No. It's something that. Uh, how do you pronounce that? No. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's, I think it's Kiwis. I, uh, Iaka, something like that. And Robert Gentleman. Um, based on the language of S, which was a statistic language, um, and they were, I think they were trying to be funny, they used R in terms of following on, uh, following on from S, but also because their names, uh, both their, in, their first initials is R. So it's amazing what you can find on Wikipedia. There we go. Um, What's interesting as well is we've only basically had two days of the summer school, or less than two days, and I've been keeping track. Um, so uh, Ross Wojcicki very briefly mentioned R at the end of his talk. Um, Stan Matwin actually showed a few screenshots of some R code followed by plots he'd done in R. Um, Chris Hankin very, mentioned, very briefly mentioned it, and Eric Catwell mentioned Weka. Uh, now the text mining we hope to show you as part of this is based on that, that tool. And it, what I'm trying to sort of show you there is that I think it's only over the past few years, really, what, what I feel like is R has really um, become popular. And that's why I thought it would be nice to, to do a tutorial on it um, today to, to get you, uh, give you a feel for what it is. So just a few random facts about R, or sort of motivated as well, really. Uh, the web, according to the website, it's a software environment for statistical computing and graphics. Um, and it's open source, so it's completely free. So uh, like me, you don't have to rely on academic licenses for SPSS, these kind of things. Most of the stuff you can do in something like SPSS, you, you can do in R, although admittedly, because it's not a nice graphical user interface, it may take a little bit longer to learn how to do it. Um, it's incredibly modular, and we're going to learn that as you do today, so you'll, you'll need to install several modules, or several libraries, um, and the way it lets you uh, download and include those libraries uh, is it, very easy, and it, 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 that's what makes it it's so nice to use. And that way, you, so people can build on top of it, it's very easy to become a contributor to the R community. In fact, uh, there's 4,000, the well, last time I checked, which was last week, it may have jumped since then, there's 4,663 available packages. So the chances are, if you want to do something in R, someone has probably already made a package for you to use. And you want, it also, as I said before, it makes use of scripts. So you basically, you code everything you want to do. You, you call functions. Um, and that way you can sort of, if you have a data set and you have a script, and from that you do some analysis and get some visualizations out, you can take that to any one of your colleagues, or, and they can validate it, or they can check, and have a look as well. Um, I did have an argument with the pub uh, last night over someone that said, we can do this in SPSS with their syntax language. And it's, it's very true, you can. Um, but it's one of the key functionalities of R, is that it's, there is no, it's, it's designed to go from the scripting end, not from the graphical user interface end. Um, and as we'll also uh, show you today, you can, it, it's similar to the idea if you program in Java, you can use different IDEs to, to use to code Java, whether it's uh, Net, NetBeans, Eclipse, or Vi, whatever. Um, but with this, you can have uh, 
Hey, Jack, uh, the Arch our console comes as default with ARM when you install it. JGR is one for Mac. Um, and what's become very popular, I think, over the past, again, past couple of years is a tool called RStudio, which is what we're using today. And so R, when you use RStudio, you're not actually necessarily using R, it's just one of the many interfaces you can, can use to interface and interact uh, with R. And uh, we have the link to the R website. So what we hope to show you, uh, some very simple basics, get you get a feel for it. Um, and then how to sort of load in some data, how we can start to explore that data, um, and then play around with it, manipulate it. Uh, we'll show some, just some types of visualizations you can do, uh, basic plots, uh, world clouds, and geo visualization. And we'll also show some text mining and sentiment analysis as well. Um, hopefully we'll have time to get through it all. Okay, so the first thing we want to do uh, now is actually, I'll just talk you through our studio. Uh, in fact, we'll do this, we'll do this simultaneously. Uh, so if you all go to your PCs and click on the start menu, for all programs, our studio, and then click on our studio, um, it should hopefully load up. So there's um, four, uh, well, four main windows to R, to the R Studio. Uh, we can only see three of them at the moment. Uh, I think most of you are only showing three windows. Uh, one is the, the main console window uh, for getting input and output into R. Uh, you have the workspace where you can view uh, any variables uh, or any data that you've downloaded or uh, are using currently. And again, you will see that uh, increase as you play with it. Uh, we also have, then have um, a, a space here where you can show plots. Um, uh, access to certain files, uh, view your packages, and as well get help, which we'll come to shortly. So that's basically what our studio looks like to start with. Um, that, that, when we, I'll come to using the fourth window, which is using scripts uh, shortly. Uh, we'll come back to okay, so in the terms of interacting with the console, you can just do some simple arithmetic. So if you want to just try little simple things in the console window, uh, 2 plus 2, um, or whatever you want, multiple, you can try these particular examples, and you'll just see you'll just get some, the answer straight back out, or you should just get the answer straight back out. Uh, feel free just to have a, have a go now. Uh, make sure you're familiar with interacting with the console. And again, just make sure that no one's getting any, back any errors or anything, it's all just plain ball. Yeah. We'll do it that way. <laughs> Sorry, we get it Okay. So the idea is you can simply put some input into the console, and you hopefully should get some out back, output back, out again. So nice, nice, easy thing to start off with. Everyone happy with that? I'll take it. Yeah. Okay. What we can do next is declaring variables. Um, again, those. Familiar with programming will take to understand the concept of a variable quite quickly. Uh, for those not familiar with the concept of programming, what we're doing here is holding some information, holding some data inside the system, and we're using a name to, to hold that distance. So the, we're going to keep uh, uh, some value which we're going to call distance in, in the uh, store that in the system, and we're going to assign that the value of 15. Uh, and then if you simply type uh, the value, you can get the output back. Now, interesting thing is you can also use uh, the equal sign. Uh, just in the same way you can use the angle uh, arrow bracket and the dash. Uh, it's really, I think, come down to practice, best practice, if I remember correctly. Originally, it was, it, was, it was so you didn't get confused between using the equals to do some sort of comparison. Um, 
but it was always a bit, for those familiar with programming, it's very strange to go from being so familiar with using equal signs to using the angle bracket and the dash. So you can use either way, uh, but it's good R practice um, to go for that option. So semantically, no difference? No, the only, th the advantage you've got, if I, I'm going to put myself on the spot here, is I think you can do that. But we'll do a different number. I think, yes, so you can go back, you go the opposite way with the younger bracket. I don't know if you'd ever really need to or how much you'd want to, but that, you do have that option. And so it gives, it gives direction, with it, which the equal sign doesn't. Um, and again, we'll just work through that example. So we had... Um, Second, sorry? Okay. Ah, thank you. So we'll come to you using. I don't know if we do. I don't think we do assignments in the inside functions. But yes. Yeah, so, okay. So that's where. It, and then, of course, we can just do manipulation straight with variables themselves. We don't have to actually. Uh, play with any numbers at this point. We can just get manipulate the variables themselves. Everyone okay with the concept so far? Keep it, keep it simple. To, to, I apologise if it's a bit slow for those, but we'll um, up. So the next thing then is, uh, again, we have functions inside R. So again, those that are familiar with programming understand the concept of a function. Um, those that are not, the idea is basically it's number goes in, number, or something goes in, something goes out. Usually number goes in, number comes out, but not necessarily. So ABS in, in itself is, called, is a function, uh, it stands for absolute, and if we put um, any number in, positive or negative, we'll always get back out the, the absolute number, the positive number. But the idea is that you're basically saying, I want the absolute of 42.5, and it will produce back, uh, sorry, minus 42.5, and it will give you back. 42.5. Um, and again, same with uh, ceiling, so it would just it would round the number up to the nearest whole number. And then what we can do is, which we will see more of, is the sort of well, the nice thing about R is you can have function, functions calling functions. So it gets a bit, uh, it can look, start to look a bit messy, but it's very nice that you can do it all in one line. So you can have the absolute of negative 42.5. And, and wrap that inside the ceiling. So you'll get, the first thing you'll get back is 42.5, and then it will call, from that number that it's returned, it will then call the ceiling of that number and give you back 43. Again, is that an okay concept to work with? Is that, people are happy with that? Um, other very nice, nice, useful things with R, and particularly that work well in our studio, is if you need any help. And so, You simply type uh, question mark ABS, and in this window here, it will bring up the help function, the help page for that particular function. And then it'll tell you there how to use it, uh, what the value it is that it expects, what the value it will give you back. Um, again, for those not, not too familiar with programming speak, um, the argument is um, the data we put into the that's required of the uh, function. So in this case, the, this x is in what we call the, the argument. We can also run uh, some functions, not all of them, will give you um, an example. So if you have example brackets and then the function name, what you'll get back is a walkthrough of um, how it can be used. So it will take, actually take you through um, a particular example uh, where it uh, plots some data and it makes use of the absolute function in that plot. So it sort of shows you how, it, how you can use it in context. And in this case, you get back uh, a plot from the, the example. Uh, ignore those, the, um, the hyphen of it, the, uh, ignore the two uh, quotations to the top, it should just be a question mark, 
directly in front of the brackets. I know, shouldn't even be brackets. The top one should just be question mark ABS. So I'm not sure quite what happened there. Okay, so that was a very speedy 10 minutes. This is kind of what, what art is. Um, so I'm not really showing you much about what, it, what great things it can do. Uh, but is everyone familiar so far? Are everyone happy with the very basic interface? You know, numbers in, numbers out, essentially. The idea of calling functions. Okay. So uh, we'll move on to the, uh, the next part of the, uh, the tutorial, which hopefully will be a little bit more in-depth, a bit more interesting than the start bit. Uh, which is called VAS, but not the Jonathan Summer School. I quite cleverly called it the Vastopolis Association of Social Media and Safety. Um, so, you know, see what I did there. Um, which, it's very, very convenient. Basically, basically, what I'm trying to say is we are all members, collectively, of VAS. Uh, and it's very useful in this particular situation uh, because the city of Vastopolis has suffered an unusual flu epidemic. Um, and the people of Vastopolis are avid Twitterers. Now that is extremely convenient because of course we're the Association of Social Media and Safety, which means this is a perfect case uh, for us to look into. Uh, so we can try and find out uh, what caused this unusual flu epidemic, or see if we can learn more about this unusual flu epidemic uh, by analysing, uh, I, call, I have to call it microblogs for copyright reasons, they're not tweets, they're microblogs. Um, so you should really say that the people are microbloggers rather than Twitterers. And so that's what we'll, we'll try and work through now and see if we can um, and find some answers about what's going on. Now, what we, we, we were sort of to and thrown at this point, whether to get you just to keep typing things out, or whether to give you like a cheat sheet. Um, and I think some of these functions, or well, some of the things we show, get a, look a little bit complicated and trying to type them down, particularly those at the front here, or people that have the back to the screen, it's gonna be a nightmare. So what I'll do now is I'll take you through getting the cheat sheet script, bringing the script into our studio, and then you can look at so you can go through each line at a time, and you can either try and write it out yourself, or you can just uh, run that particular line. Um, it's your call. So uh, what we need to do is open a browser. So if you open a browser of your choice, uh, Firefox or Internet Explorer. Is yep. this uh, uh, Challenge MC1? So it's the learn by chance. Second, sorry, is it? Is it Bus Challenge? Uh, I triple E. This. You forgot. You are, oh, you've reminded me. I should also point out this. Just out of curiosity, again, we'll do another hand showing. Um, who is familiar with the Visual Analytics Science and Technology Conference annual challenges? Not that many of you, actually. Okay. Uh, so who specifically worked on the 2011 Visual Analytics? Two, three, four, if you include me. Okay, which is actually really interesting, which is good, because we thought that loads of people wouldn't know the, know the answer to this stuff, and it would be a little bit boring. So uh, this is, a, okay. At the end of this time, I'll explain more about these particular challenges. They're quite interesting. Uh, but for now, uh, what we're using is data from 2011. There was part of uh, the VAST conference. Um, and the idea is they have an annual challenge. They give you some data. They give you a question. And this particular one we're working through is sort of a mini challenge one of three mini, ch mini challenges that were offered in, in 2011. Um, but yeah, I'll, I'll hopefully show you some more at the end if, the, if this time. OK, so if you all have a browser up, if you could go to r.chrisrooney.co.uk. Um, and you should get uh, this page. I'm still here clicking, so I'll, I'll. Hopefully, you've all got it up now. So, uh, under data. You've got uh, an R cheat sheet for this course. If you right click on that and uh, save link or save target or save as, whatever your browser tells you. So it's the first link under data. Um, you can, I think, ideally put this wherever you want. So I'm just going to put it on the desktop. And you would get, basically it's called this, it's called, it's a .r file, that's 2013 cheat sheet .r. And we'll save onto the desktop. Uh, Okay, and when that's uh, finished, if you go into our studio, uh, in the top of our studio, uh, there's a little open file uh, box, and we're just going to go to desktop and open the cheat sheet. So now we suddenly see you're making use of four windows within inside our studio. 
the top left is now showing you uh, an R script file. Um, so the, we have some of the original uh, calls we made in the, uh, in the first part, and then we can we have the more advanced stuff coming uh, below it. Okay, has anyone not got the script open yet? Anyone having difficulty? Okay. Everyone happy to proceed? Obviously, I'd appreciate it if you don't um, play with it just yet. We'll try, and, we'll try and talk through it and go through it step at a time. Okay. Okay, uh, I also just forgot to show this is uh, Bostopolis. Um, so we've got uh, the place for different districts, <laughs> lake side, downtown, uptown, east side. Um, there's uh, several hospitals, an airport, uh, and a few other locations as well. Um, I also need to give credit to uh, City University who uh, re-rendered the original map um, into one that was much more aesthetically pleasing and is also available in vector, in vector format, although we can only make use of PSG. Uh, you hopefully see this map again later on uh, in the course. But the, the original map also is valuable because uh, there are some details that, we, that matter at the end. Are there? River flow. So they're missing in this map? The, the, the river flows. Where, where, where the river flows, which direction it flows. Oh, it's it, you can see it from the satellite view, but you can't see it from, from uh, the okay. <laughs> okay, so the first thing we're going to do now is load in some data. So uh, this is going to be an interesting test because we're going to have. Uh, 26 odd people trying to load a 40 megabyte file from uh, a server I got on 123 Reg. So we'll see what. I, it says I've got no band bandwidth limit, but we'll find out soon enough. Um, now, what we can do, instead of to save you some uh, trouble to type your things out, is if you have our studio open, you place the cursor on the line you want to execute. So in this case, I've got my cursor somewhere on my load line. Um, and then if I. Actually, I'm just going to. Do this first, okay? And then I'm going to hold down Control and press Enter on that line. And what you'll see is that line should get copied into the bottom left, and you'll get a little stop icon uh, has appeared whilst I'm trying to process. Um, I'm guessing this will go horrendously slow along, but we'll have to wait and see. So, control and enter is the hotkey, and make sure your cursor is on the line that you want to execute. Okay, so it's, I have the, the cursor's returned, so mine's finished loading, the stop sign's gone, and now I've got a tweet data in the top right. So once it's finished, you should have tweets on the top right. Officially microblogs. Uh, what should we hold? Control, Control and enter. Oh, and then. Yep. No question there. Right, and you want to be able to the Oh, yeah, I got it. Yeah. I think it's a call and paste. What's your So, Control and enter. Okay, so is, that, is everyone, everyone's data finished downloading? Anyone having trouble with the control option? We realized a few, with Internet Explorer, it 
breaks things massively because it's a very useful web browser. Um, no, okay, no one's having the trouble using the control and enter. That's good. Okay, there's a few things that we can do to explore our data set. So we do names, brackets, uh, and then the, the. So, okay, I should explain uh, a few things before we do this. I forgot. What, we, what you're downloading there is what's called an RDA file, which is like an R binary file. So what that means is at some point we've either, we've accessed data, the raw data in some way. So with R you can do this through a CSV file, a MySQL connection, a Hadoop connection. Uh, one of those 4,000 packages will give you access to most ways of accessing raw data. Uh, we've tidied the data up a little bit so it you know, suits the course. Uh, and we re re uh, saved it as a binary R file. What that means is that the, the size reduces from like 130 megabytes CSV to a 40 megabyte file. It's less time to download, less time to, uh, uh, to, to process and, and use. Uh, and so when you, load, when you call the load command, it loads it. The load, what, what's happening here is the URL command is grabbing the file from a, uh, a URL. It's then, when that, it's then loading that file when it gets it back. And what that file gives you is a variable uh, or data frame, as it's known in R, called tweets. Um, that is a two-dimensional data set, both rows and columns. And you can then run certain processes on this two-dimensional data to investigate it some more. So if you call names, uh, brackets tweets, it will show you the column names. Um, so we have a unique tweeter ID, which is just an incremental number. Uh, the date uh, or the day, in this, this particular case, would be the tweet was made, uh, uh, the geo-tracking, the latitude and longitude, we've also done some pre-processing on the raw data to extract a, a district value, uh, and the actual tweet or microblog itself. If we then call uh, end row, and that's a number of rows of tweets, we'll get back a value, so that's 1,223,071 rows. Uh, rows. So the data set we'll be working with is, is largest, a million records. So when you're, we're doing some of the calculations, or some of the functions in R, it's a little bit slow. Uh, be aware of the fact that we're, we're playing with a million rows of data. Which in some worlds is not massive, in other worlds it is. Uh, and if you call head tweets, um, you will get uh, the first, I think it's 10 rows of data. So you can see what the data looks like in terms of how well it's formatted and other aspects. So if you want to have a, a quick try with those three commands, see what kind of thing you get back. Um, Or oh, I guess some of you may have already jumped ahead. Okay, uh, I'll jump through some of this stuff. I'll, I'll only give you a short amount of time to, to play with these things. Uh, we realize we've got quite a lot to get through and we've started quite a high time. Uh, so one of the things we can start to look at the data uh, is we can find out what, what is the range of this data. When, 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 is the, uh, when do these tweets happen? Uh, and so what we can do is using the dollar sign, we can access a particular uh, column of the data. So that's basically saying so for the, within the date column that uh, belongs to tweets, uh, run them, uh, that inside the min function, or provided there's an argument to the min function, and it will process back what the, uh, the minimum date is. In this case, the first tweet happened on the 30th of April. Uh, similarly, if we find out the max, uh, that value, we find out the, the path, uh, range through to the 20th of May. So simple uh, function calls, we can start to investigate the data, find out some more about it. Um, and then this is a uh, slightly more complicated situation now, where we're going to again calling um, a function inside a function. So in this case, we're making a table. Now a table basically uh, is a way of aggregating the data. So it shows how many unique tweets ID uh, exist in the tweet. How many ID, unique IDs exist in the tweets ID column? And it will give us a table out. And then from that table, we can then be sorted into increasing values. And then, to make it more complicated, 
we get back, we did specifically want to extract just the first value in that range. And what we get back there is the person who tweeted the most. So, yes? Say again? Okay, uh, T is true, just Boolean. So, uh, decreasing is true. And the table is doing sort of yes. by. Yes. So what I suggest you do is, is have a go uh, at this, but try just doing taking the table command out, just or just using the table command uh, at the command line. Oh, sorry, the table function at the command line. Uh, and then what happens when you use the sort function without this one at the end? And then what happens when you put the one back in? Is there a way to go directly? I think if you just double click on the you go view tweets, view brackets tweets. So I think that's not an idea of a tweet, it's an idea of a person. Right? Yeah. 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 So, uh, as pointed out, we've got the view command that has asked it. We'll let you look at the data uh, in a tabular format. I think we need to enable some sort of a trace library. Yeah, looks like we don't have it enabled part of the it looks like we don't have to enable, so it needs to be enabled. Oh. So it's that capital V? Uh, capital V. Capital V. Oh, well, try it. Uh, yeah. Capital V. Okay, uh, we'll, we'll uh, push on again. Um, so, uh, hopefully you all got that command working and you've got a bit of a feel of how it works. Um, interestingly, the user with ID, uh, uh, 29,999, tweeted 18 times. Um, so I did say originally that the people of Astopolis were avid tweeters, um, or tweeters, but 18 times in what, a month and a half, not really that uh, impressive, I don't think. Um, so perhaps that's a bit of a lie, they're not really avid tweeters. We have, uh, we, have, we do know now how much they tweeted. Um, I am going to... Do we need to... Uh, Rick, do we, we, need, we need to run that command, don't we? We do. Okay. <laughs> we don't have the first one, I think. Yeah. yeah. We don't need the first one. Uh, okay, I, I realize I'm a bit short on time. I don't want to go into details of what this actually does. It's basically a, a conversion on the message, it's converting it from ASCII, is it? It, it converts it from however it's encoded at the moment into something that ASCII would be able to do. Yeah. There's a phone challenge in there that breaks some of the things that So, in order to do some of the text mining and sentiment analysis, we need to convert it into uh, UTF 8. So, uh, we can, so it gets rid of the funny characters. So uh, essentially, on the second line, uh, the S apply line, if you just do the control and enter on that line, it'll take a little while to process. Um, and what that, what that basically does is transform your message column uh, with a different character encoding. You won't actually get any, any output back, but the curse will just return. Um, but if you get no errors, you know it's, it's worked. Okay, um, the next thing we might want to have a look at that is what our data looks like. Uh, so we maybe just want to see how many tweets are, are tweeted each day. Um, and so again, we're going to make use of this table function, which again aggregates our data. So we can find out uh, if a group, as you say, someone said a group line is about explaining it. 
So group the data by dates. So we basically get two columns in, in a sort of sub data set, which is all the unique dates and how many tweets happened on that date. Um, and then we just give the x label uh, a value and the y label a value. Um, and you should then come back with a plot in the bottom right corner of our studio. Again, if you just do control and enter on that line, it should just produce the plot, plot automatically. Um, if people don't want to look at the plot in more detail, they can. There's a zoom. Uh, Again, the plot's a little bit slow because of the size of the data set we're working with. Uh, you can click on the zoom button uh, near the plot, just above the plot, and it'll open up in a fresh window and you can see it in a larger size. Okay, uh, again, we'll push through. Any questions so far? Any? Okay, uh, again, I hope it's not just to be in case of doing control enter without taking it in. Uh, I hope it's not going. Let me know if we're going too fast. I'm not covering it clear enough. Um, sorry. Yes. This plot is kind of a um, uh, universal command, and it chooses the right visualization. Yes. I mean, uh, if, I, if, I, if I would pick three axes, then what would happen? Good question. I know with you, with one axis, you should get usually get back a box plot if I remember correctly. Oh yeah. Um, yeah. And this is three when we're working. So we can do a wide frame or. Yeah. Uh, perspective. Perspective. Uh, just putting one D if you want to. We can try doing it with just one column. Yeah. So. Ah. I pressed control of accident. So in this case, I'm not actually making the table, I'm just using yeah. a single column, so a single uh, variable. It's having a, a good old thing, what to do with those uh, million items of data. may have regretted doing this without testing it first. Is there a way to do it? you like an x axis of a million, up to a million, and then for each one, like a value? Probably. <laughs> Chris, can it export as vectographs? Yes, if we certainly do PDF exports. Uh, I'm not. I think there'll be. I, I imagine there is a package for doing. Oh, yeah, yeah. Yeah. These are just thrusts, right? Oh, for each day, it's giving you a frequency. Didn't actually do anything, did it? Yeah, for each day, gave you a frequency. Okay, it's kind of a matrix. Uh, yeah, maybe even a matrix, but it's. Is there any sort of uh, I think that's still low fancy uh, like for breaking the current? Uh, oh, that's nice. Looks like a folder. There's something there. I was uh, struggling with that. Probably should have done something a little bit. You just crashed it. I think so. Yeah. <laughs> you give oh, there we go. Yeah. Oh, there we go. Okay, so that's where we get back. Um, yeah, as you said, you called it exactly right. right. An index from zero to a million index going up. Okay, uh, next thing we can also think to do is working with um, samples. So, if we find, as we've seen, a million rows is a little bit slow, uh, it's a bit of a pain to work with. Uh, so, we can, uh, I realize I probably put some of these slides in the wrong order. But what essentially we can do here is call, uh, get a subsample of the data. Um, how best, how is it, okay. So again, we're, you saw before we used the square brackets um, where we, actually, I'm gonna do this in a different order on purpose. Okay, we saw before we used the square brackets to get the one out from the, uh, the sorting uh, uh, function. Now, with our tweet data frame, we have two dimensions. So we've got rows and columns. So we used to use the square brackets, but instead we can put a column, we use a column, x, comma, and 
and then we have our two values, our rows and our columns. So which means that we can get out a particular value from our data uh, with seven comma five, is the seventh row and the fifth column. In that case, we come back to South build, or we can pull out the whole of the, I should say, seven, um, seventh row or the whole of the fifth column. Someone else noted, uh, asked this before, it's a very good point. Again, for those used to programming, indexes in R start at one, not zero, uh, which, if you're like me, took a long time to get, uh, get used to. Um, but that, that's, uh, okay, so that's how that works. And then we can also get ranges out as well. So like the colon lets you do a range of seven to 11. So that pulled, that's pulling out the seventh, eighth, ninth, tenth, and eleventh items, uh, or so, uh, well, in the fifth column. So I get, I get, now I get five particular districts from those tweets. And in, using the same concept, I could also specifically grab particular tweets with keywords in them as well. So I can do like a string matching. And again, I can do this with uh, another function that um, our office we built in, which is this rep now, where I'm looking for anything uh, any term that used of any use of the word flu in my message column, and it doesn't matter uh, whether it's cap whether it's cap uh, capitalization or not. And so that says, because I've got a comma here, I'm getting any rows where the message is matched against flu, um, and I'm bringing all the columns back, so I'm leaving that blank. So I'm not filtering the column. And what that will then do is if we do n row of treats flu, it brings about 8,726. So that's to say that of those million of Tweets, 8,726 contain uh, a, a keyword flu in some way. Everyone, everyone okay with that? Was that right? Yep. Okay. The other thing, again, if you're, if you're a programmer, which you'll hate, is that is not, uh, that's not saying that flu is a parameter of the object tweets. That is just a string. Um, and I've done that on purpose to annoy people because it annoys the heck out of me. Um, but that is, that is just a, a variable name in the same way that you can get rid of it and it, it means the same thing. Um, it does become a, a useful way of, of defining uh, when you have a subset, because you're kind of saying this is the flu subset of tweets, but it's purely there for um, your own use for uh, rule of thumb sort of thing. Um, it's not there as, it's not a, not a parameter of tweets. So that's another, another annoying thing uh, about R in terms of compared to more traditional programming. So I'm just going to jump back to now what I was saying about sampling. What we can do now is where we had tweets that flew, we want to just have uh, a tweet on sample. And in this case, we can um, create a sample where we're taking a thousand of the tweets. So we use sample, basically, if we give sample, the function sample, a, a list, it will give us back uh, however many of those we want, uh, randomly selected from that list. So the list is from one to the, the number of, total number of tweets, so from one to one million, twenty odd thousand. We want a thousand of them, and what we don't want, it, we want, don't want to put them back. So what, what all sample is doing is for a thousand times, it's going, I'll take that one, I'll take that one, I'll take that one, I'll take that one, from our, our, our numerical list. Uh, from one to a million of um, If we had replace equals true, then it'd be like, I'll take that one, and I'll put it back, and then I'll take that one, which means you could take it twice, is uh, a possibility. So we leave that as replace equals false. And what we have there is a completely random sample um, of the tweets from the data. So now again, if we plot uh, the, the, the table of the data, you see it's a much different uh, shape the last time. So, we obviously generally quite flat and then a peak at the end. Uh, here it's much, much different shape. For those 1,000 tweets uh, are not necessarily reflective of the actual data set. Uh, I should also note that if you're doing anything with randomness, uh, such as sample, you should know it's good practice to set a seed. Those who are not really with pseudo-randomness, anyone good at explaining pseudo-random to people that aren't familiar with pseudo-random? <laughs> uh, computers have no way of, very, of being completely random. They have to have a starting point. Um, and if you tell the computer what its starting point, in, point is, it will always give you the same set of random numbers. Which means that if you want to do some analysis and you want to pass that to a collaborator or someone else to verify it, if you set a seed, 
their randomness will be identical to your randomness. So if you don't set a seed, you end up with different data and uh, everything becomes chaos. Uh, but this is a good example of how bad sampling because we don't we get something not reflected to the original data set. So I realize I'm a bit, bit slow. Uh, what we do have to do is use a for loop to uh, do some nice sampling. Uh, what we're, essentially what we're trying to do, what we want to do instead of having to be of the data, is we want to get the same percentage of tweets each day. So where we saw uh, there's a much, well, there's a higher number of tweets here, what we want is something that looks like that but with a subsample. And this bit of code here will go through each day and will uh, append so uh, three percent of those of those tweets from that day to a, a new sample data set. I realise that because we're massively behind time, I'm having to skip over this without really explaining it properly, which I'm a bit annoyed at uh, myself, not anyone else. Um, but it's it, that's essentially for those familiar with programming, you can get an idea for it. Um, for those not familiar, I apologise. This is going to look horrendous. Um, the other interesting thing is there's a general rule of thumb with R that if you need to use a for loop, you're doing it wrong. We suggest I've not found the best way of doing this yet. Um, uh, but either way, there it is. Now, uh, with this one, it's particularly important if you do execute these commands, and Rick will be making use of our tweets.sample variable later on. So what happens when you have a for loop is if you do control enter from the top line, uh, it will process that line, but this line, it won't process until you, you control enter all the lines, and then finally process the, the closing bracket at the end. Um, once you process the closing bracket, it will run through the for loop and generate your tweet sample data. Um, and what you should get, then get, be able to do then is see how many rows it has, which will be about 3% of 30,000. And when you plot it, you should see it looks very similar to our original million tweets. So the shape should be the same. So please just take a few minutes now just to uh, run those, execute those few, few lines of code. Make sure you've got a tweet that's sample that's gone through the, that loop, uh, and you can plot something that looks like this. Yeah, that's just a ridiculous thing. I want to do this in art. Yeah, sure. Someone's made it somewhere. Yeah. Oh, yeah, okay. reset the variable. I'll do that. Just wipe it off. Um, you so, can. Sorry. I've done the, the, the sampling twice, so I'll just. If you, if, it has to have the same name. Oh, you've appended it to it. Okay. Um, I can't really. I can't. I don't want to do it. I know how you get rid of all, uh, that one gets rid of all of them, but I don't know how you get. That's a good point, actually. How do you clear off a single variable? Uh, you maybe just packages. Do you remember how to do it? Um, this is the other thing that's annoying about R. If you need to Google for things, it's always a pain because you have to sort of put R in, and then it's like, do you really mean R? Is that just a typo? <laughs> Ah, uh, yeah, that's it. It's like for processing graphics library, you have to do processing to all. Okay, does everyone run those few lines? No errors, we're happy. Okay. Um, so, we just going back, we, I showed you earlier how we could get all the tweets uh, that contain the word blue, so we have 8,726. And now, if we plot that same data, our flu data, and again, we group them by date. Uh, we suddenly see that uh, we have a massive increase in flu tweets towards the end of the data set. So again, for those, for those I'm trying to investigate what's going on in our data, it suddenly seems to suggest that around about uh, the 19th, everyone's tweeting or microblogging about having flu. So there's suddenly a massive increase uh, in the data set. Uh, Again, we can do some more subsetting as we want to the data. 
So we can um, just look at the last five days. So again, we can subset this into two different commands. We're subsetting, uh, and we take out the last five days. And we can go down to 7,000 on tweet. Oh, that's it. And what we've been using a few times throughout that is a function called table, which is doing a group by. If I want to group by two variables, uh, I need to use something a bit different. I used to use, use a function called aggregate, um, where I pass in a list of the things I want to group by. So I, want to, I create a list where I've got a date value uh, and this string. And then I want to aggregate from those two uh, values from my input. Uh, I want to, the, the aggregation I want to do is a simple count. So I say function equals len. Fun is, is function. It's not describing your current uh, state of mind. Uh, you could have something like sum or uh, I think mean as well. This is, uh, functions are variable. If you do question mark aggregate, it will show you what you can, what you can do. Uh, and then we have to, uh, a new data yes. set, so uh, treat.flu.lastfiveDays.summary the last five days of summary is our latest data set, and we can also plot that, um, see what it looks like. Uh, looks like we don't have the library. Ah. Coming on the library, yes. Yeah. Well, yeah. Yep. Okay, I'll show you after that. Okay, again, if I can have your attention for a moment. Uh, we have reached a point where we're now actually going to introduce one of the four parts of the library that R has to offer. Um, so, for those of you who so far have tried running the library, you should have had an error. Right. GGplot2 is not installed. Uh, the way we install libraries uh, is going to tools at the top of our studio. Uh, install packages, and then you can start to type the package name, and it will usually give you autocomplete as well. So we start G G two, and then we can click install. Yep. So again, for those who didn't see it, tools, install packages and start typing the name. In this case, it's, the name is ggplot2. Click on that, and then we can click install. And once that's installed, you should then be able to run the library command, which then will load the package and, and make, allow you to make use of it. And now, you, you're able to call the function qplot. So qplot wouldn't, wouldn't exist within R by default. You need to upload in the library, this library first, and then you can continue. In which case, you can then plot the uh, summary data, and we can also uh, color it by district now. So now we can get a breakdown by district of our data. You extract the districts. As far as I remember, they went up in the data set. The origin data set. Which is quite entertaining that Rick and I both have done the same, exactly the same thing, completely separately. We did, we did points and pixels. So you create a load of points around the districts, and then for each tweet, you detect which. So you're it's like uh, checking whether they are inside of the polygon. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, exactly. With Postgres, with JS. Or what? Uh, I think I, I just wrote a manual, a manual thing to do it. Um, I, I think I found that the algorithm on line somewhere. Like you're just checking whether it's uh, on, on which side of the line, right, for each, for each segment. And exactly. You just uh, end. Uh, yeah. And then, yeah, so you, you yeah. We, you, so we have two copies of the data set here. We both did it separately. Like, it's because the, um, it we, wasn't at middle We're not doing anything with districts. We were just uh, visualizing the, the density, the sort of the heat map, and we were yeah. just uh, making judgment based on what we see. So we're not having. We're not supporting any of these. Uh, no, we, uh, we did some text analysis with, with Eric Atwell, and they were specifically adamant they wanted to look at it, look it by district. So we, we gave them the data in that format. And that can get a little bit awkward to read, doesn't look particularly pretty. Um, so we can do something more advanced with QPART. Uh, right now, we're looking at the same data, we're colouring it. Uh, in fact, what we, we are 
The last one, we coloured it by district. In this one, we're just going to give the colour a grey, which means the outline is grey, but the fill is by district. So we're going to fill in these areas. Uh, we set the position, it's the stack, so the one on top of the other. Um, we're going to make a nice smooth line, so we're going to jagged. And it's an area plot rather than a light graph. So we get a, a stacked area graph using a different, basically, we're just setting different parameters within our cube plot. And we can go from something that looks like that uh, to something that looks like that, and just changing the parameters. So essentially, you are mapping the data attributes and the visual attributes with these equal signs. Yes. Yeah, so some of them is specifically. Uh, yeah, some of them are just setting parameter types, and then other ones we're mapping, actually mapping the attributes to the plot. Yeah. Ah, good point. Uh, that is a an annoying thing about aggregate, the aggregate function. If you run the aggregate function on its own and just see the results, you'll see you'll have a column called date, uh, a column called district, and then you'll just have the, the, the count, the group by value, will just be called x. So it's a bit, a bit. Not very useful. You can't. Put them. But the granularity there is just so it's by days. It's not hours. Right? Uh, so it's yeah. just smoothing this. That's the other annoying thing about R is when the date parameter, the date type in R is only date. It doesn't go break down to minutes or seconds. You need to start using more uh, different timestamp. Right. Yeah. Parameter. Yeah. Post six one. I think you need to use. Um, just to show what. Um, Rick showed there, uh, I need to create it again. Okay, uh, if I tweet start last five days of summary, if I click on that, I see my th three column names, date, district, and X. So on the 16th of May uh, in Corner Town, uh, three people tweeted. So that's what our aggregate function is giving us. Sorry? I don't know. <laughs> this is just bizarre. Okay, uh, unfortunately, we are massively behind time. This was supposed to be the uh, fun bit where we, you go away and actually have a play and get to grip more with, uh, with the system and find out some interesting things. Uh, although I think we are a bit. Uh, quite behind time. Um, what I time we have another forty-five minutes. We're supposed to ask this on the screen. Is any any massive objections if we just start through this and, and not go to the coffee break? I didn't think everybody has anyone was drinking. <laughs> Okay, so just for the record, Nisha suggests no. <laughs> that you, you all work through the coffee break. We all, we all, everyone had a bit of coffee before the start. Is anyone happy? If, what I suggest we do is we plough through until about 10 to, and then you've got 10 minutes to change back into the other room, grab a cup, grab some refreshments if there's anything left, and we'll do it that way. So we'll, just, we'll do this for another 35 minutes. Um, again, unfortunately, I think time management has really let us, uh, let us down here, and so if I pass on to Rick. Um, we'll talk through some more uh, other aspects. Uh, um, so, so far, uh, we've got these tweets which have, uh, they have an ID, uh, they have a date, um, they have a message, we have, they have a latitude and longitude. Um, so far, we haven't really done much with the message. Um, that is the text of the tweets, and we haven't done anything at all with latitude and longitude. Um, so what we're going to do in the next half hour or so is just have a, a quick look at some of the stuff we can do with those. Um, so that's a little bit of text analytics, um, and I do mean a little bit. Um, and then uh, a little bit of geo-visualization. Um, so, what's the last thing we do? Get to questions. Um, we're going to be using a, a text mining package called TM, um, which you'll probably need to install um, through our studio, so that's uh, tools, install packages again, um, and choose TM. Um, and before you load the library, uh, you need to remember this first line, otherwise things break. Um, the reason for that is that TM actually calls, uh, makes calls to a Java text mining library. Um, it makes calls to Weka, in fact. Um, 
And if that's not set, something will break internally, and we won't get any output. So, install the TM package, um, run those two lines. Then what we do next is we, we set up a, a corpus of text. Um, in this case, we're actually treating each tweet as an individual document. Uh, so we've got our sample of tweets, we pull out the message column, which is a, just one column of, of stuff. We say we're using that as the source of our corpus. Um, we tell it what encoding we're in. Um, that's probably about right. Um, and we tell it to read it. <coughs> and it will do some things. Um, and then probably there'll be no, no visible output. But we'll have uh, a corpus set up in, in the TM package. Um, once we've done that, we need to spend a little bit of time cleaning our data. Um, in particular, um, since it's Twitter, people tend to spam URLs around or quite a lot. Not so much in this data set, but certainly in real Twitter. Um, so we run a function that searches this regular expression, um, which detects URLs, and replaces them with an empty string. So all we're doing there is blanking out any URLs that are in our corpus. What's the reason for doing this? Why aren't we just comfortable with this? Um, if you want to keep them in, then, then you can. Uh, but we're going to do count frequency later and do some scanning and occasionally you end up with HTTP being the biggest word in the oh, data set. Um, which, you know, may, maybe maybe that's that's to do with how we're doing scanning. But for this data set, um, we convert it all to lowercase because we're going to be doing comparison between words when we count the frequency and we, and we want to treat words as um, identical garbage case. Uh, we remove any extra white space that's in there uh, we, we remove any punctuation, um, and we remove stop words, uh, which is surprisingly easy. Um, in each of these, what we're saying is map this function onto my corpus. Um, so the corpus is the set of documents we set up. We map this remove punctuation function, which is part of the library onto it. Um, we map remove words onto it, and then we give it a list of words to remove. Um, I'm using the, the predefined set of English stop words, but you could add things to this list. You could you say use all the English stop words plus these other words that I don't want to appear in my data set. Okay, what are stop words? Um, things like and the okay. things that would probably be the most common words if you yeah. added in, in terms of frequency, but don't really tell us anything um, about our document. And then, um, they're part they're part of the library. Um, in this can case, you that? yes, yes, you can. You can define your own stop words. Here, I'm saying use the stop words that are predefined for English. There are, there are stop words defined for various other languages, or you can give it your own list completely, or you can take an existing list and add things or remove things from it. Um, and then, where do we get to? Do I need to send it in on the G section? I can't remember what I told you to do. The last thing it said on this. Yeah, is it uncommented? Okay, um, and then your your cheat sheet may look a little different to this. There should be this line here. Um, it's on a new line, I think. <coughs> yeah, which will say uh, stem them. So we're stripping words down to the, the stem, so we're removing uh, verb endings and so on, so that we get a better idea um, of what are the most frequent frequent words. That's kind of an error. Yeah, what, what sort of error? Yeah. Um, there is in fact one package we need to install uh, that didn't install with TM. What was that message you sent to me? Make sure we. Yeah, yeah. And then we we to go. Um, if you go for tools and install packages again, uh, we're going to install a package called Snowball C. Uh, it's capital S for, for Snowball and a capital C. Um, Um, and once you've done that, try try stemming it again. Stemming it is quite an expensive operation, so it will sit there for a bit before it gives you control back.
Same way we did before, tools, install packages, work cloud. Then, uh, once you've done that, you can just say, give me a work cloud for this corpus of documents. Um, you give it parameters that are minimum and maximum size of things. Um, the maximum number of words you want in your work cloud. Um, I think random order tries to place the largest ones first, which is probably what you want in your work cloud. You want your biggest words definitely showing up. Um, this rot per is percentage that you allow to rotate onto their side. Um, so you, if you set that to zero, you can have a, a work cloud where everything is horizontal. Um, there are other layouts you can use. There are other color schemes you can use. Um, that's, that's in the, the help stuff. I'm not going to talk too much about it. So this is a work cloud for uh, the entire of our sample. So they, they show us the same way. No, because there's going to be some randomness in placement, and I haven't set a seed. Uh, okay. I think. Um, does it look yeah, same? Uh, <laughs> different? Looks different on yours? Uh, like, probably everyone's going to look different to this one. Uh, well, do they look the same as anyone else's machine? That's what I'm interested in. Uh, yours looks as good. Yeah. 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 There, there are ways of specifying um, in reproducible fashion. Probably. You're assuming like what the process. We should have this work back yes. as well. Well, you can see I've got a new Twitter as, as a whole thing. If you look on yours somewhere, there's probably a new tweet. Yes, okay. Yeah? So I didn't do stemming, so that's my excuse. Um, probably you don't you might not want to be using a word cloud anyway. There are established problems with word clouds where longer words look more important. 
Uh, but that's just an example of the sort of stuff you can do with that text mining library. Uh, you can do other more interesting stuff like uh, TF, IDF, and so on. There's a, there's a whole bunch of text analytics stuff built into the library that once you set up your corpus, you can just say, do this on it, and it'll come back with some answers. It's quite nice for that. Um, we're going to do one more bit uh, on text, um, and then we'll do uh, a little bit on geo. Um, so <clears throat> we've looked at uh, common words. Um, we can also look at sentiment in the message. Now, um, uh, there are lots of ways of doing sentiment analysis, um, but usually it's hard with Twitter because they're quite short messages. You don't get a lot of context to work with. Um, so we're going to pick one method because it's easy. Um, that is, we're going to count the number of positive words in the message and count the number of negative words in the message. And the difference between those two is going to be our sentiment score. So if someone uses a lot of negative words, it's going to have a negative score. This is not a great way of doing it. People may be sarcastic or so on, but it's an easy way. Um, so we're going to run this code, which is from this guy's sentiment analysis tutorial. Um, there are some bits. One is load his sentiment scoring function. What that will do is when we feed it a message, it will count up how many positive words, how many negative words in it, and give us a score back. Um, I'm going to load some lists. We're going to load a list of positive words, a list of negative words. Um, if you want to change what's in those, then, then you can. Um, they actually include common misspellings um, in these, which is quite a handy thing to do with Twitter because people on Twitter can't spell. Did, did you make this list up yourself? No. It's, it's referenced in the file, it's from some guy's paper. Oh, this, this guy? That, that guy references it. No, the, the list is from some other guy's paper. Oh, I see. Um, and if you read the top of the text file, it's got, um, got the references to it. Okay, we just run that script, we don't yeah. have to load it. Nope. So, if you run those, um, and then this is the line that actually does the scoring. What we're doing is saying, we're going to create a new column in our sample from sentiment. And what we're going to store in it is the results of calling um, our function um, <coughs> and get the score back. So essentially what we'll end up with is a sample of tweets where we have another column that is the sentiment uh, for that tweet, for each tweet. Does it work? And then score it. Done scoring, uh, you can take a look at the results. Obviously, you can look at them individually. What we're going to do here is we're going to draw some graphs in it. Um, so, again, we're going to plot and we're going to plot an aggregate again. Uh, we're going to aggregate by uh, <coughs> date and district, uh, ag aggregate sentiment by date and district. Um, and the function we're going to use this time is mean. So, we're going to pull out the average sentiment for each district for each date uh, using this aggregate function. Um, and then we're going to plot it. So we've got date there, we've got average sentiment there. Um, we said we want a line chart. Uh, we're colored by district. Um, and maybe we can see some things in here. It's mostly in this range, and then something happens at the end. Um, so that's the line plot of it. I would argue that's probably not the clearest way of looking at it. If we change uh, from line uh, to an area plot in the same way that, that you saw Chris do earlier, I mean, you have to be very careful because this can be quite misleading. Um, because the sentiment for this thing is actually the width of that bar. Um, <coughs> and it's very easy to misread that if, uh, if you're not clear what you're looking at. But you can see there is a bit of dive that goes on there. Um, <coughs> where sentiment goes negative in the last uh, three or four days of it. 
It's, it's a nice chart to, to show results, but you have to be very careful that you understand exactly uh, what it's showing. So that's um, two quick ways of doing some text analytics with R. We've done <coughs> counting term frequency and drawing word clouds, um, and we've done a, a really easy bit of sentiment analysis. It's nothing too complicated, but um, <coughs> there's some papers that uh, have been published based on the, the work done in this, and it, it seems to be reasonably reliable. Um, we're going to finish off uh, by looking at the latitude and longitude uh, of these tweets um, <coughs> and drawing some maps, um, which is made slightly more complicated by the fact that this isn't a real scenario, so we have a fictional map. Um, if you had real tweets, this would actually be a slightly easier process. Um, but we're going to need three libraries. Um, so you'll need to install these with tools, install packages. Uh, we need ggmap, we need png, and we need City of Bastopolis. Um, we read it from uh, from the URL and then pull that in as an image. And we're just going to do that so that we can draw it on top of a real map later on. Um, getting maps in R is actually surprisingly easy. Um, if <coughs> this is using ggmap, um, you can call the getMap function, you give it a location, um, and it will do some geocoding for you. So I give it Hendon, London, and it will pull up a map of Hendon. We are roughly there. Um, you tell it what type of map you want. There's a list uh, in the documentation. I think there's terrain, hybrid, satellite, so on. Um, and you can tell it a zoom level. Um, and it will go away. This is a Google map, but actually you can use different map providers. It will do Google, it will do Bing, I think it will do the, the nice statement maps. Um, and it will do things like OpenStreetMap and CloudBank. Then, once you've got the map, you tell it to draw the map. Um, I'm telling it to draw the it <coughs> all the way to the end of the scale. Um, if you want to draw it without that and long, you change panel to extent, and it will draw it to fill the screen. Um, so getting getting a map in is quite easy. Um, we've given it zoom here. Uh, depending on which provider you use, you either give it zoom, or you give it the bounding box of the map you want back, um, which is quite handy for what we want to do, um, because <coughs> in, in the vast challenge, we've given the the, the the map we want, and we're given the coordinates of the, the four corners of it. Um, so we say, um, give us a map that corresponds to this area. Uh, we're using the, the Toga map from Sega. Um, and then do some plotting. What we're doing here is we're building up a plot um, as a combination of elements. Uh, we call GD map with our map uh, panel to plot the base layer, which is the map that underpins it all. Um, and that does things like set the scales accordingly. Then, uh, we draw our, 
of our map image that we downloaded uh, on top of that. Then on top of that, we draw some points. So we say geo point, um, and then we state how we want things to be mapped. So I'm mapping x to minus longitude, uh, which is because we messed up the data. Definitely has to be minus longitude. Um, and y is latitude. And then I tell it what my data is going to be. So I'm doing uh, data for one particular day, a very little subset here. If I wanted to do a graph <coughs> to show all my data, I just pitch the subset stuff. Then I can add a title that I can, I can add other things on. Um, I end up with a map. Um, the nice thing about this is <coughs> uh, producing a map this way is we can map other things quite easily. I think I have an example. Um. I didn't save it, did I? We can map other things. In particular, we can map color, um, and we can map the, the alpha channel, so we can set how transparent each point is. Um, so, for example, if you put comma color equals district, and that's color with the with the UK spelling, it may may work with the US, but uh, we'll see. So there, there, put color equals district, and redraw the map and see what happens. I believe is a color place, but I assume enough people complained. Um, <laughs> but so you can map uh, district color, which will show you basically where the districts are. Um, in, inside AES, because it's map. And he's got a comma. Yeah. Color equals district. Um, yeah. Anytime I make a plot, it tells me the to see the next plot. All right. Uh, it must be a preference. Um, so that's color by district, which is kind of interesting. Um, but we can also color by stuff we just worked out. We can say we can color by sentiment. So if, if we change color equals district to color equals sentiment, then we get a map of uh, people's sentiments at various places. Two on the end, it's 
it's scale underscore fill underscore something. Yeah, I might have to do that. I did it earlier, then that we did do lots of it. Okay. Um, so maybe you've got it colored by sentiment. Um, probably you want to adjust the color map for that sentiment at some point because you want to, you want to switch diversity to color map across the next year. Um, we're running short on time, so if you really want to do that, um, come talk to me later and I'll put it out. The last thing I want to show today um, is density plots. Um, this is something you have to be quite careful of when you're doing dot plot plots of this data. Um, you might think, okay, that's interesting, I've got a lot of points there on this particular day. Um, in fact, if you look at <coughs> a density plot, you can see that just it's a fact that most people tweet from there. Um, so if you're looking at sentiment, probably you should be scaling it um, according to the density of the urban area, um, which is possible, um, but is slightly more complicated. So um, we're running short on time, so we just thought we'd do a quick wrap up. Today we've looked at um, introductory R. We've looked at how to load data in, um, how to do subsets of data, um, how to draw, aggregate data and draw graphs. Um, then we moved on to some really simple text analytics. Uh, we looked at word frequencies and word graphs. Uh, we looked at uh, scoring tweets for sentiment. Um, and we looked at a tiny bit of geovisualization. Now, R can do an awful lot more in any of these things. Um, it's just, <coughs> there's a limit to how much we can get through in, in this period of time. Um, I think what we tend to use R for Middlesex is quickly looking at our data. Um, it's really nice for scripting, generating some graphics quickly that, that show you bits of the data set. Um, what it's not great for is interactivity. Um, you can make your plots interactive in R, but it's quite a lot of effort. You're probably better off something with something like, like D3. Um, so what, the last thing about R is it does have, uh, you, you, have, you can get Java libraries for it, so you can plug it into any, any Java application, uh, send commands, send script commands, and get data back quite nice. Images, not quite as nice. You can tell R to save the image to disk and the plot if that is in the PNG to disk and then retrieve that into your Java application. So maybe not, not really what you want to be doing, but certainly in terms of getting data in, data out, you can do it through an, an API. And I say Java, and I presume there's other libraries as well. Not check. Well, libraries for other languages as well. Not check. Um, apologies for the, the time management. Uh, we felt at some point we were, certainly in the first half, we were rushing through some of it. So I hope we've got to overloaded you or just made it a bit of a, a control, an exercise in between professionals and pressing control and enter. Uh, so we, we hope you've, you've got something out of it. Uh, hopefully we've made a few R converts in the, uh, in the audience, but I bet that might be very interesting. Um, as well, thank you. Uh, you want to drop that window down a little bit? Uh, as you've, you've seen, uh, all the material you use today, I, I just dropped onto the website at r.chrisreview.co.uk. Uh, Rick doesn't mind me putting on my train, that's good. Um, but the slide, I also want to just note, the slides were actually made in R as well, which is, I think, well, it's certainly within R Studio, um, which, well, the DKM thinks that's quite cool, um, in that we could compile it and it just turned into a, a HTML and JavaScript uh, set of slides, and so you could view them there, um, and then the cheat sheets, all the data sets, and some links as well are all available. So please, uh, have a play, and uh, yeah, it's all available for you. All right. Yeah, so that's, uh, <coughs> yeah, thank you for your attention. Um, it's been a, a bit of a slog through this session. <laughs>